Kinetic molecular theory. So we're basically talking about the movement of atoms. All right, so um, atoms all have kinetic energy, whether they are a solid, a liquid, or a gas. Even solids like the desk that you're sitting at, um, those molecules have movement, they have kinetic energy. It's small vibrations, but everything has kinetic energy. We can calculate how much energy they have, how much kinetic energy through the equation you see here. So one half the mass times the velocity squared. Um, we can calculate the energy or vice versa. If we want to know how fast something is moving, we could rearrange the equation to um, cal like insert energy and mass to find how fast something is moving. Um, so kinetic molecular theory, we typically apply to gases just because there's significantly less movement in solids and liquids. We tend to focus on gases when we're talking about kinetic molecular theory. Those are the atoms that are moving the fastest. And um, in kinetic molecular theory, we, we make assumptions based on an ideal gas. Now, an ideal gas is not realistic, but most gases come very, very close, except for these two um, these two instances at high pressures and low temperatures, gases do not behave ideally, but most gases do come pretty close to ideal behavior as long as those two, um, the high pressure and the low temperature don't apply. These are the four main um, assumptions that your book really talks about. So gases consist of a large number of particles and those particles are extremely small. That's true um, if they were um, if they were bigger, they would be moving slower. Um, so we'll, we'll get to forces in a little bit. Um, but basically, like different forces might apply. Um, let's see, gases, they take up a lot of space. There's a lot of space in between the molecules. The molecules move around a lot. They can be compressed so the gases can be pushed together. They can also be like released. If we, you know, open a container, the gases will fill an entire space. Um, collisions between gas particles are elastic. What that means is that they're going to hit each other and they're going to hit their surroundings and they're going to bounce off. We make an assumption that there's 100% elasticity, which means no loss in energy. Um, we know that that's not exactly true. Every time um, like they hit each other or they hit something else, a little bit of energy is lost, uh, maybe in the form of heat or something like that. Um, so assuming that there's 100% elasticity isn't quite correct, but um, that is an assumption that we make. Uh, gas particles are in constant rapid motion. Yes, if they weren't in motion, they would be a liquid or a solid, <laughs> um, or that would be like significantly less motion. Um, so yes, they are in constant, very rapid motion. They do move very fast. They have weak intermolecular forces. Um, average, kinetic ga ugh, average kinetic energy of gas molecules depends on the temperature. Um, that is true. The higher the temperature, um, Temperature is just a, me a measurement of heat, and heat is a form of energy. So if we're increasing energy, we are increasing temperature. So those um, they have a direct relationship, and, uh, and the average kinetic energy does depend on temperature, even though you don't see temperature in the equation, um, the kinetic energy equals half of the mass times volume. Um, OK. Intermolecular forces. So we're just going to go through the four basic types. We did do this in a previous chapter, but just as a reminder, so London dispersion forces are the weakest type. Um, they're also called Van der Waal forces, and it's an instantaneous attraction between two nonmetals. Um, so nonmetals, they share electrons, and as the electrons sort of rotate around the two, um, the two uh, atoms or the two nuclei, the there's like an instantaneous part where there's more electrons on one atom than the other. And when that happens, you get like a moment of a partial positive and partial negative charge. And then they move again and that partial positive, partial negative charge um, goes away and then kind of comes back opposite and so forth. So it's that temporary moment that 
causes the attraction. And that is an extremely, extremely weak force, right? Because as soon as you get that attraction, it's already gone. Um, so these, anything that has a London dispersion force is mostly a gas at room temperature. Um, so something like carbon dioxide, right? We know that that's a non-polar molecule. It has London dispersion forces because every once in a while, one of those oxygen, there's more electrons on one oxygen than on the other. Um, if you remember the linear um, structure to that molecule. Uh, dipole dipole is like the next in strength. And this is when we have two nonmetals that uh, create a partial negative and partial positive charge. They are still like within the compound um, between, for example, we have hydrogen and chlorine here. So between hydrogen and chlorine, chlorine's gonna pull on them a little harder, but they are still sharing. Those electrons are still spending some time on hydrogen. They're spending most of their time on chlorine, but they do spend some time on hydrogen. So when we have a hydrochloric acid come up next to a hydrochloric acid, because the electrons are spending most of their time on chlorine and least of their time on hydrogen, we get an attraction between those, which is dipole-dipole. So that's the partial negative attracted to the partial positive of the next molecule. So again, intermolecular forces between two molecules. Intramolecular forces is this covalent bond that's happening right here. So inter versus intra. Um, so just as a reminder, right, we are doing intermolecular forces, the ER, that's between molecules. Ra is within. All right, where were we? Here we go. Hydrogen bonding is the next like strongest. So hydrogen bonding is actually sort of the same thing as dipole dipole, except it's happening with hydrogen. And then hydrogen can only create hydrogen bonding if it's bonded to or being like attracted, like a, there's an attraction to an intermolecular attraction to a nitrogen, an oxygen, or a fluorine. Now, those three are the only ones that are small enough and electronegative enough to create that hydrogen bonding, um, which is a strong bond. There has been recent studies, like very recently, I just read something like maybe a month or two ago um, about how hydrogen bonding, there's instances in which case it's weaker than a dipole dipole, which is not historically what we thought. Um, so who knows, that might change in the future. For right now, um, we're just going to go ahead and make that blanket statement. But um, who knows, that might be changing in the future. And then finally, the strongest is ion ion. This is the metal non metal bond where electrons are actually exchanged, not shared. Therefore, we have the positive attracted to a full negative. So we had those partial, um, we had those partial uh, signs before. Oh, you can see it here um, with the nitrogen and hydrogen, the little like squiggly <laughs> that looks like an eight that you didn't finish. That's the partial sign. So in ion ion, we don't have that partial. It's a full charge because electrons are actually exchanged rather than shared. Um, so they're always positive and always negative, which makes that ion ion bonding the strongest.